we've created a, uh, a new world of, uh, of, of materials that is so extensive. In fact, it could be the most extensive class of materials ever made. UCLA professor Omar Yagi has been ranked number two among the world's more than 6,000 chemists based on the quality and impact of his published research. Omar Yagi, this time on Cross Section. Professor Yagi, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. You fell in love with molecules when you were just a small, ch uh, when you were just a small child, is that right? Uh, yes, uh, at, at a very early age, probably I was in third, fourth grade. Um, at the time, I, uh, I slipped into the library that uh, actually was supposed to be closed, but uh, the doors were unlocked, and I went in and I came across one book that, uh, as I was flipping through the pages, I saw structures of what might have been water or methane, but some drawings of molecules, and that really captured my imagination because I thought, wow, this is what the hidden world really looks like, what it's made up. That was very, very attractive to me. And once you understand how, uh, what things are made up from and how, let's say, uh, their composition, uh, the atoms, are connected to each other, then you have really a new view of what those uh, materials are. And, and furthermore, as I learned later in my life, uh, one can then alter those connectivities and potentially be able to turn some poison into medicine just by simple movement of one atom from one position to a, another position very close to it. And you were only about 10 years old at the time? Well, I didn't think all that when I was 10 years old, but I did fall in love with those drawings and it propelled me more and more uh, to study what they are. Um, I became very curious about um, other molecules and uh, kept my eye on, on those nice drawings, yeah. What are the big questions that you address in your laboratory? In my lab today, we work on a class of materials we call metal organic frameworks, or uh, as now they are commonly called MOFs. And these are simply, uh, if I was to describe them in a simple way, um, they're made from inorganic components and organic components, or metal ions connected by organic units to make what looks like some of these models here, a scaffolding or uh, to make an extended structure that has openings within it. Can you illustrate? Sure. Uh, um, they are composed uh, entirely of joints, which are intersections, and links, which uh, join those joints together or link those joints together to make an extended structure. And if you're I could see an atom and you are floating inside the structure, you, this is what you would see on the atomic level. And what we have developed, the chemistry that we've developed, is essentially you're able to stitch these molecules in many different ways to make different structures that have different pore diameter and different kind of space. So we can change not just the metrics of the system where the pores could have uh, different dimensions to fit different um, molecules of interest, but also we can decorate the inside of these pores with specific functionalities that make things stick better than they would otherwise. And therefore, this acts as a trap that goes around and seeks specific molecules like hydrogen or methane or carbon dioxide or others and enclose them within these pores. And so it becomes a lot easier for us to work with dangerous gases like hydrogen or methane. So you can trap these dangerous gases inside and then in the fact there's a door that you could close to make sure that they don't escape. So let's say for example right now if you were going to use hydrogen in a, for automobile fueling a typical automobile would have to drag behind it a balloon that is five meters in diameter filled with hydrogen. Well, the idea here, the vision with these materials, is that by creating an interior that 
allows hydrogen to stick onto the internal surface. Now you can compact all that hydrogen that fills very large space into a much smaller volume and therefore making it more practical to use as a fuel. Of course, we're not there yet. We can do this at low temperature for hydrogen, but we cannot do that yet at room temperature. But we are making progress by functionalizing and changing the constituents of these structures um, towards making uh, room temperature storage material. However, for natural gas, uh, already the dream of using porous materials to um, concentrate natural gas into the pores is becoming a reality. Is there the potential for MOFs to trap carbon dioxide coming from power plants, for example? Indeed. So the same principle applies to carbon dioxide. And, and in my lab, we are very actively working in that, in that area as well. Um, carbon dioxide is, is a gas just like methane and hydrogen. However, unlike methane and hydrogen, it, it's easier for us to compact carbon dioxide. Uh, However, the, the, the challenge there is that you want to pluck out carbon dioxide from a mixture of other gases that would be evolved from combustion in a power plant, such as nitrogen and water and, and oxygen. So this is the power of this chemistry comes to play. Uh, now you can functionalize the pores so that they can only see carbon dioxide, grab carbon dioxide, put it in the pores filling up the pores or let's say the solid and then once the solid is saturated or is filled with carbon dioxide now you have a valve on the other side that releases carbon dioxide into um, a pipe that would go under the ground uh, to be stored in geologic formation for long-term storage. Of course capturing carbon dioxide in that way is a lot of fun and it's a very meaningful way of eliminating uh, carbon dioxide from reaching the atmosphere. The long-term storage for carbon dioxide is another matter that needs more work uh, in the sense that it would be much better for us to trap it but then develop chemistry that allows you to turn carbon dioxide into a fuel, into a liquid fuel. And then you burn that fuel, you capture the carbon dioxide that results from that and create a cycle that is a closed cycle where you don't have uh, harmful byproducts. So turning, capturing carbon dioxide is practical. Uh, turning carbon dioxide into a fuel is something that is still in the research and development stage. But you're saying that capturing carbon dioxide is not just a distant dream. It's something that's realistic and could be done. So I think, I think we're within uh, just, a, I would say, three to five year period before these are ready to deploy. That's very impressive. When you were so fascinated by the molecules as a 10-year-old boy, you probably didn't realize that your interest could eventually lead to helping to save the oceans and, uh, and the climate. I think, I tell my students always that, that I think you need to solve a scientific problem, an intellectual challenge first, because that could open up many opportunities to helping society overcome various challenges. And isn't that the history of science, one of accidental discoveries, where it's not the case that a scientist says, I'm going to cure cancer, I'm going to save the environment, I'm going to protect the oceans. You work on a problem and then... I think a lot of great science starts that way. I, I also think that thinking about the problem and trying to solve it is also another, another part of doing meaningful science. The part that attracts me the most is the first approach where you're trying to discover something new. You have a hunch of what might work or what might not work and you go into it and you discover something completely different and, and you can capitalize on the opportunities that that, that, that discovery uh, presents. You are watching world-renowned chemist Omar Yagi discuss the process of research and discovery on cross-section. To me, I am an explorer, so I like going into unknown territories and try to create new forms of matter that potentially um, have, have benefit to society. 
What makes a great scientist? How much of it is creativity, imagination, perseverance? And I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what makes for a, a great scientist. I think uh, someone in my early uh, career said to me, you can be an excellent scientist, Omar, making these metal organic frameworks because you know there is a library of inorganic units and a library of organic units that could be combined. So the number of MOFs that you could make is endless. And, and, and in that way, we've created a, uh, a new world of, uh, of, of materials that is so extensive. In fact, it could be the most extensive class of materials ever made. But he said, you can do all that. You can keep designing these structures, but you will never become a great scientist unless you address issues related to society and follow through your science. Essentially what he was saying is taking your science beyond the laboratory into applications that benefit society. Why do you love these materials? Why do you say that MOFs are an unparalleled class of materials? On a fundamental level, you took two areas of chemistry, organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry, that people always thought they are independent and fused them together to make a whole new class of materials and I think a new kind of chemistry we call reticular chemistry. Right, I wanted you to explain that. Uh, you're known as the founder of reticular chemistry. Reticular chemistry is essentially stitching molecules together into extended and large structures. So it was very important to have the stitching done by very strong bonds and that's really the distinction between reticular chemistry and other uh, chemistries that here the building units are connected through very strong bonds to make robust materials. How many of these materials have you invented? Well, I think in my lab, I don't know exactly the number, but it's, it's, it's well over 500 different structures. And uh, you can imagine this is a very attractive area for research in many groups around the world. Um, it could be uh, hundreds, maybe maybe a thousand groups around the world, both in academia and industry, maybe also government uh, labs have have been making MOFs. So there are uh, over 20,000 different MOF structures that have been invented. How does the new generation of MOFs compare with earlier versions? Uh, essentially, we know now very well how to design the backbone structure. Now we're just playing the game of what if I introduce a group of atoms here or here or there, what does that do to the properties of the material? And that's how we got from a, a great challenge which is storage of natural gas to solving that challenge. In just about 10 year work, we're able to solve a huge challenge uh, which that is of, of, na of natural gas. That's how we're solving the carbon dioxide challenge. So the the, the uh, pace of progress becomes much faster when you're able to modify. So we put a vial in the oven and let it stay overnight. Usually the crystallization process, uh, it's, um, it's a reversible process, you don't want to disturb it. So you want to sit it quiet in the oven, and the next day, open it, you see these nine single crystals on the walls. I visited Fudan University uh, a number of years ago, and uh, Hekshang Deng, who is in my group now, uh, working on his, uh, on his PhD, uh, came up to me in one of the meetings and said, uh, Professor, I've been trying to make new kinds of MOFs and I, can't, um, I have not been successful. And the nature of chemistry, although in my, so far I've been uh, implying that I can stitch molecules into structures that I know what they are, but I don't always know what they are. We don't always know the structures that we're going to come up with because there are many different possibilities that two building units can fall into many different possibilities. So there is um, a component of trial and error. So, so DJ comes to me and says, Professor, I can't make new moths. And I said, well, how many times did you try? 
He said, well, I tried a couple of times, maybe three times. And I said, well, what about 20 times? What about 100 times? And of course, I tell this to a lot of students, but some of them find many reasons why that wouldn't work. Others look at me and say, OK, I will try. So I immediately saw in his eyes the uh, willingness to try 20 times, 100 times, even more, just to make a new kind of structure. I was, I was um, surprised at that time, because 100 times to me, it's a, a really a lot of work. But um, after that, I go to the lab, I went to the lab, and then tried a lot of times, maybe not 100, but like 80 or something. But I see a crystal. I see that I can, I, I can, I can get the crystal if you try it enough times. So it's really the way that um, um, you, you combine the thinking and the putting it into practice and to combine with what we have in the experiment and then to do more to approach the sweet spot that we can get the mouth synthesis. For people like me who are explorers and trying to discover new things, when you make a new structure, uh, that's, that's something that is yours. You can look at it and admire your creation. And then once you're able to take that structure and find a useful, a use for it in solving a problem, then, then it really is an immense feeling of, of joy about what you've just done. And I saw that in DJ. He was undeterred by the number of times he would have to run a particular experiment. And I knew right there and then that that's the kind of students I should have in my lab. Well, I think it is the livelihood of uh, professors like me to work with this really s superb variety of uh, characters and personalities and minds. And uh, I'm, I'm, I feel that I'm very fortunate in my life to have this chance to be able to get up every morning thinking that I'm going to be uh, helping young people not just learn how to make new materials, but, but learn how to deal with difficulties, how to think independently, how to, be, how to use the power of evidence and data in making their decisions every day. I actually um, emailed Professor Yagi and uh, met with him and it was, I, I was not only interested with the research but also just found that it was very, he's very approachable, very easy to talk to for me and definitely he's taught me a lot. I visit a lot of schools and when I come to UCLA I haven't had a chance to meet Professor Yagi at that time. And then I waited until I made an appointment with him and we talked in his office. And then I decided this is definitely the lab that I'm going to join. He was very forceful and said, you shouldn't join this lab unless you absolutely know you want to do it. So I had I'd been an athlete all my life and I realized that when I'm competitive, I do my best. And I wanted to be on the cutting edge of research. And so it took me a month to figure out that I really, I had to be in this lab to be happy you need to be able to operate in a world of chaos. Okay, there is no, we don't have a plan, we don't have a blueprint. So you need to be able to be observant about experiments and learn as you go. A world of chaos, so what do you do when things go wrong? Uh, you have to look at the failures and try to see whether they're telling you something. There are hints along the way and, and that's why the power of observation in science is always paramount in, in, in the discovery of new phenomena or new materials or whatever it might be to making a difference. And so you observe along the way and then you develop a feel for what you need to do next. Okay, so, and, and along the way you're grounding your interpretation of these observations in sound science. It's not magic. It, you have to think about this in terms of sound science, but you should always keep your mind open to what nature might reveal to you. And that's why you need to be observant when you're doing these kinds of, um, this kind of work. 
You are watching world-renowned chemist Omar Yagi discuss the frontiers of science on Cross Section. Thomas Edison said, I have not failed, I've learned a thousand things that do not work. So it sounds like that's what you're saying also. When things go wrong, that's telling you something you learn from it. In indeed. That, that's, just, that, that's just small steps on the way to success. So persistence in science is also very important. You have about two dozen students and researchers who work in your lab at any one time. How do you decide which students to accept? Um, I'm usually more, I, I like to, to give people the benefit of doubt, so I'm not too judgmental when they come to me wanting to join my group. You have to feel that they are really excited about doing the work, excited about learning, and willing to be open-minded about what it might require to be in the lab. And you're taking them from a world where they usually had ordered schedules and, and they knew exactly uh, the path to success. Now they're entering into a world where nobody knows the path to success. And, and so they have to be open-minded and they have to, uh, to, to be willing to work hard and be persistent. Like a certain 10-year-old boy who went into a library when, when it was closed. I wanted to see what's behind those doors. And you see that same excitement in many of the students who work in your lab. I think I see that uh, in the most successful students' eyes. So there's that sparkle about, about entering into this uh, world of new uh, forms of matter, new structures, uh, potentially important applications. You can see it in their eyes. I th you can feel it. Yes, you can, you can feel it from, the, from their body language, from what they say, how, what words they use to express uh, what they're feeling. What are the remaining challenges for you? The next challenge is that within this space of trying to take building units and hooking them together, so far uh, these materials have been based on just a couple of building units, a couple of different building units. What happens when you have more than two or three or four or five or six different building units into one structure? Could you create materials that combine the robustness that you need with the in brilliance and, and intelligence of a biological system where those biological systems like DNA and proteins are made from many different building blocks? And so we can see where we want to go, but in the middle there's a huge space that needs to be explored and not a single scientist or a single institution could explore that space. That requires really a global approach to developing that material space that I call the materials beyond. The materials beyond, the potential for generating new materials is a huge. New materials that will supersede anything we've ever made in terms of their specificity in terms of their uh, importance in various uh, applications. They will transform the way we think about chemistry. And so the next challenge is going beyond my lab into the world and building centers of excellence in various parts of the world to focus on various aspects of this molecular beyond and exploring how do we build materials from many different building blocks and studying what kind of properties they might have. And how would this next generation of new materials benefit society? There are many concepts that biology operates on that have not been introduced into artificial materials. Well, the first thing we need to do is make materials that are made from many different building blocks, just like biology has done. And I think that's the first step. So I think they're going to be much more specific. I think they're going to be able to design materials specifically to convert, let's say, methane into a liquid fuel or carbon dioxide into a liquid fuel. Um, you're going to be able to convert solar into uh, electricity and many other applications. I just want to say that many uh, new developments in science or many uh, uh, directions in science, many problems in society have been solved by design of new materials, by discovery of new materials. This is the space that we need to be in, the molecular beyond, 
exploit it. And that's what I have been doing uh, globally. Um, the global effort has also another side to it, which is even more powerful than just making materials. So the one component is building centers of excellence, working with high caliber scientists both in the US and abroad, collaborating in centers that might be in Vietnam, Korea, and other countries, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, collaborating on making new materials and exploiting their applications. But in the meantime, what you're doing is you're bringing two scientists to collaborate on a problem, two scientists from two different parts of the world that uh, collaborate and talk about science and understand each other. And in the meantime, you're breaking those barriers that separate people. So I see the molecular beyond is a good way to use science as a, a tool uh, for people to understand each other and overcome the challenges that have been um, uh, introduced or that have been artificially mounted between them. And are you interested in mentoring great minds in other so, countries, even um, even beyond materials, even beyond chemistry? So, so many. This is not a building centers of excellence around the world is not a new idea. Many countries and many institutions have tried that. Usually, um, they want to extract talent from a completely different culture into that country, and. And that usually doesn't work because my creativity and my livelihood is here. This is where I have connections. This is where this is the environment that uh, I can create in. We need to create those environments in those centers. And what that requires is this deployment of this mentoring model that has made the U.S. a great country for innovations and has sustained U.S. creativity is the relationship of a mentor to a mentee. My relationship, let's say, with Heckshang Ding and other students that have gone on to mentor other students in the U.S. So in the U.S., we have a very strong system of mentoring uh, that has worked very well. We have perfected very well. This culture is based on the idea of mentoring, not just in science, but in other fields. However, we would like to, to use this model to enable centers of excellence, enable these collaborations between the U.S. and other countries. And the idea is that even though I may not move over to another country, I could um, take one of my protégés who might be interested in exploiting opportunities elsewhere in the world and help them build research groups and centers in that country, help them hire scientists, help them through my uh, expertise and, and, and collaborations, help them build productive centers of excellence. And in the meantime, you're building very strong collaboration with the United States through this mentoring model. In making new generations of materials, new generations of MOFs, how difficult will the challenges be to overcome and how optimistic are you that you can do so? I think the challenges are, are much greater than what we have already seen. Uh, when I started building structures from molecular building blocks, no one really thought, very, very, very few people thought that this is possible. Arizona State University took a chance on me and I succeeded in doing it, and we demonstrated over and over again, this is a good way to make new materials. And now, as I said, many people are making these materials in the same way that we have made them. The challenges ahead, we haven't really, we have not been used to thinking in terms of heterogeneity in order. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about many different building units making a crystal. So that's heterogeneity in order. We've been talking about so far, we know, we learn how to think about crystals as being repeat units of just few units, not many different units. And so this is a new way to think about doing these materials. So that's one challenge, is changing the thinking through making these materials. So that's why this requires collaboration between the American scientists and 
scientists around the world because it does need, just like we need uh, scientists around the world to solve global problems like clean energy, clean water, poverty, and so on. We need those scientists to come together to, to exploit the molecular beyond or the materials beyond. Professor Yagi, congratulations on your work and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. This has been Cross Section featuring Omar Yagi. For more information, please visit newsroom.ucla.edu.